Well, hello and welcome to Bible Study Fellowship. Hey, I have missed being with all of you these past few weeks, but you only become a grandma for the first time once, and I wanted to savor every minute. I want you to know how proud I am of each of you for persevering through this difficult study. And I want to say, hang in there, okay? Don't give up, even if you feel like you're behind. Just keep moving forward. God will honor your efforts as you study his word. And every minute you are in the scriptures, you are learning something new about him. So I want to send some love out this week to online groups across Alabama, as well as classes in Auburn, Eufaula, Greensboro, Greenville, and Selma. To East Tennessee Day women online groups, as well as to classes in the Tennessee communities of Crossville, Teleco Village, Jasper, Sevierville, Red Bank and Signal Mountain, and Georgia groups in Lookout Mountain, Atlanta Perimeter, Blue Ridge, Canton, Cumming, Rome, and Woodstock. We are so grateful for the privilege of studying with each of you. But we are halfway through now our flyover of some of the key themes in Isaiah, and we're going to be looking today at Isaiah 40 through 48. So if you will open your Bibles and apps, I'll pray and get started. Father God, you are sovereign over all things, including time. You know and control the future and are absolutely trustworthy to do everything you say you will do. Father, we stand amazed today that you are not only able to accomplish salvation for sinful people like us, but you're willing. Your heart is to save sinners. So Holy Spirit, please teach us today. Would you open our eyes to see and believe all that you want to teach us? We pray that you would accomplish your purposes in our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, what are you afraid of today? What worries are stealing your peace? You know, whether we want to admit it or not, fear lurks in the fringes in all our hearts. We fear the social and political tensions in our nation, the decisions being made by our governments, the next natural disaster, the next pandemic. We fear what tomorrow will bring for our families or those that we love. We fear because we can't control our circumstances. We can't control the people around us or even our next heartbeat. We fear because deep down we wonder if God is truly in control and if we can trust him to do what is best. Now, for 39 chapters, Isaiah had prophesied God's just judgment on his generation. God had warned them. He'd urged them to repent and return to him, but they stubbornly refused. So Babylon would come as God's instrument to destroy Jerusalem and carry the survivors off to exile. Now, we need to understand that this exile was not divine neglect. God did not drop the ball. The exile was for Judah's good, to humble them and move them to a place of dependence on and trust in God. But I don't suppose it felt very good. Imagine being told that this is what was in store for you and your people. But as we open to chapter 40, Isaiah shifts gears, and he looks 150 years into the future to speak comfort and assurance to the Judean exiles who are in Babylon. And what he says to them speaks to our fears today. God himself offers the only source of true hope and comfort. He longs to save sinners, whether then or now, and he has done what it takes to to accomplish his salvation. I mean, not only is he willing to save us from sin and the mess that we've made of our lives, but he's able. My friends, God has a heart to save sinners. He can be trusted to do so. In these chapters today, he urges us to put our trust in him, the living, incomparable God who alone offers salvation. So we're going to look at this passage in two divisions. First of all, God is willing to save sinners. Chapter 40, verse 1 through chapter 42, verse 9, God is willing. And God is able to save sinners. Chapter 42, starting in verse 10, 
through chapter 48. God is able. Now, before we dig into these chapters, I want to clarify what I mean when I talk about salvation or being saved. In this life, salvation is from temporary things. You know, you saved me from having to walk the dog or from having to take that phone call or from doing something else that I really didn't want to do. Even if we were to literally save someone's life, all we are really doing is extending it for a while. That's human salvation. But God's salvation is different. God's salvation is unearned, undeserved, and unending. God makes a way for the guilty to be declared not guilty, saving people from the penalty of their sin. He makes a way for people who are enslaved by sin to be set free from the power sin has over us by giving us his spirit. And he has made a way for believers to one day be free from the very presence of sin. God comes to his enemies, to people who don't want to be saved and people who don't deserve to be saved and to people who have no clue how desperate their condition really is. And he steps in and he offers them salvation. All other promises of salvation by other people or philosophies or products will fail. Only God can truly and completely save. And the amazing thing is, it is the desire of his heart to do so. But what if you, like the people of Judah, struggle to trust God's heart? I mean, what if the circumstances of your life today have caused you to doubt God's love and power? Take a look at chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort. Comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for. God now speaks comfort to an exiled people who would be tempted to think they had been forgotten because of their sin. God wanted his people to know that despite the judgment Isaiah described, their identity as God's people would remain intact. Their sin had been paid for. God's heart was not to abandon them, but to save them. Now, from where we stand in history, we know the payment for Judah's sin was provided by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. God sacrificed his own son to rescue and restore relationship with those who would turn to him. That was God's plan all along. Now, verses 3 to 5 in chapter 40 would have brought reassurance to the exiles that God himself was going to lead them back home to Jerusalem. But we can see its ultimate fulfillment in John the Baptist, announcing the coming of Jesus. The glory of the Lord, the, the sum of all his attributes and all his work and all his purposes, was indeed revealed when Jesus came. Jesus displayed God's love and mercy and grace and wisdom and power and wrath and justice and patience on the cross. And one day, when Jesus returns to this earth, indeed, all people will see God in all his glory and fullness. People and nations like grass will fade away, but the word and glory of the Lord endures forever. Now, verses 10 to 31 give us a breathtaking description of the tenderness and majesty of God. He is the sovereign Lord, coming with power and ruling with a mighty arm. But he is also a shepherd, caring for his flock, gathering the lambs and carrying them close to his heart. This sovereign Lord and shepherd was coming not to reject his people, but to tenderly gather them, gently lead them, and comfort them. Isaiah also describes God as the unparalleled creator who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and held the dust of the earth in a basket. Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, stretches out the heavens like a canopy, and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. These measurements of God not only point to his immensity, power, majesty, and knowledge, but to his ownership of all of creation 
down to the smallest detail. What image or idol can possibly compare to the almighty creator, God? There is no one like him. He alone has the power to accomplish salvation through the twists and the turns of history. In chapter 40, verse 26, Isaiah directs our eyes to the heavens. Because of God, not a star or planet or heavenly body in the sky is missing. I mean, we can't even see all the stars, let alone count them. But not only does God count them, he calls them forth by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one is missing. Oh, friends, this is your creator who assigns meaning and purpose to all of life, to whom no one and nothing can compare. No one can stop his plans to save. But despite this display of God's power, in chapter 40, verse 27, the exiles from Judah questioned God's heart for them. They thought their way was hidden from the Lord and their cause disregarded by him. Their circumstances as exiled in Babylon caused them to see God as distant and disinterested. Have you felt that way? I want you to notice that God did not meet their complaints with harshness, but with the reassurance of his unlimited, its unlimited ability to strengthen and sustain his people. Look at chapter 40, verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. I found out this week that the word that's translated hope or wait in verse 31 also means to bind together, to be joined, to meet, expect, be confident, trust, endure. So listen to verse 31 with those words. Those who are bound together with the Lord, joined with the Lord, who meet with the Lord, who confidently expect and trust and endure with the Lord, will renew their strength. You see, this verse isn't just about time passing, but about unity with God. It's about relationship. It's about knowing God well enough to trust his character. Those who live in relationship with God are strengthened by a God who never grows tired or weary. Because of God's enablement, the person in relationship with him will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. This is who God is. He moves toward his people to, in, to, in relationship to strengthen those who are worn out and powerless. He doesn't tell us to go figure it out on our own. When we are bound to him, he gives us strength and power. In chapter 41, God tells the nations that he is the one in control of their future. He speaks in verse 2 of stirring up one from the east. Now, this is Cyrus. We're going to read more about him in a little bit. While these events are more than 150 years in the future to Isaiah, God speaks of them as if they were already done. You see, God can speak this way because he owns the future, and he has secured the future as if it has already happened. God urged Judah in chapter 41, verses 8 to 20, to remember who I am. Do not fear, I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And what an encouragement this would have been as these exiles are considering this long journey back to Jerusalem. God was going to hold their hands. God would help them. God would answer them and not forsake them. So that, according to verse 20, all people would see and know and consider and understand that the hand of the Lord had done this. You see, God is sovereign over all the nations. He didn't just offer salvation to Israel. He offers salvation to the world. God called the nations in Isaiah 41, 21 to present their cases for their own idols. 
And while they were busy nailing those idols down to be sure they didn't fall over, God in power was unfolding his salvation plan. I mean, the idols couldn't recall the past or predict the future. They were, according to 41.29, false and amounted to nothing. They were wind and confusion. Now, chapter 42, verses 1 to 9, is the first of four servant songs found in Isaiah. And these describe a servant that God was sending. Each song has a specific focus, and together they paint a picture of the Messiah who was coming to save. Now, we'll look at the remaining three songs next week. God sometimes calls the nation of Israel his servant. But this song describes an individual who will perfectly accomplish what Israel failed to do. Look at chapter 42, verse 1. Here is my servant whom, I'm uphold, whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. Now, these same verses are quoted in Matthew chapter 12, verses 17 to 21, as fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And note that when God speaks about this servant, it's as if God is speaking about himself. This, this servant is an unparalleled, unrivaled person. He, he is unlike all others. 42.5 says, this is what the Lord, the God, the Lord says, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spread out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to who, all who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. So while God starts out by talking about this servant, he shifts to say, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind and free captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name, and I will not yield my glory or praise to another. God is promising a servant like no other to a rebellious people. You see, God promises sinful people a salvation they cannot accomplish themselves. And as we read these servant songs, understanding what we know about the rest of Scripture, we see that they can only be talking about Jesus. Now, God understands that we can't trust someone we don't know. So in these chapters, he has revealed himself in all his tenderness and power and love and majesty and wisdom and beauty. Who can even remotely be compared to God? I mean, the gap between God and all created things is, is infinite. His power and knowledge dwarf anything we humans could muster. God reminded the remnant of Judah, and he reminds us of these things because he perfectly understands our weariness and our fears. God alone controls this world and our circumstances and ensures that all who come to Jesus for salvation will indeed be saved. And that brings us to our first truth. God willingly pursues and saves sinners. God willingly pursues and saves sinners. How does seeing God's heart in this passage change your perspective of who he is? How has a wrong understanding of God's character caused you to mistrust him? How does seeing him for who he reveals himself to be comfort you and quiet your fears? No matter how long we study God's word, we will never grasp the depths of all God is. There is always more to learn about our gracious, compassionate, loving, wise, eternal, just, and unchanging God. God is not only sovereign over every detail of our lives, but his heart is to save sinners like you and me. What a comfort that brings. 
Now, Isaiah has shown us that God has a heart to save sinners. And not only is he willing, but in our second division, we also see that God is able to accomplish salvation. Picking up in Isaiah 42.10, God invites the whole earth to praise him as he advances like a warrior and prevails over his enemies to rescue his people. God's people had refused to listen and trust God, so he sent them into exile. But he wasn't done with them. Listen to what he says in Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. God goes on to reveal that because of his persistent love for his people, no redemption price would be too high to pay. Because of his heart to save sinners, God gathers people from the ends of the earth for his glory. Not because of who they are, but because of who he is. God's salvation is about his glory, not our goodness. Look at verse 10 of chapter 43. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. Despite the failings of Israel and their own blindness, they were going to be the living evidence of God's heart to save sinners. God would pour out his spirit on their offspring and they would be a witness to the nations. You know, God had done great things for Israel in the past, but now he was doing a new thing. In fact, the salvation he would work among all nations through Jesus Christ would be so great that all he had done in the past would just shrink in comparison. God would blot out and sweep away Israel's sins for the sake of his praise and glory. Now I want to ask you, <clears throat> can your idols do that? Can they take away your sin? Can they give you eternal life? No. The person behind salvation is the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens and overthrows the learning of the wise. Knowing who God is and all he has done makes the worshiping of idols seem almost comical, doesn't it? I mean, why would anyone think that an inanimate object could see, understand, help, or save them? And we can laugh at the thought of bowing down to a piece of wood, half of which was used for fuel. And yet, who or what do you and I look to for deliverance when we are up against the struggles and pain of life? Food? Entertainment? Alcohol? Work? Hobbies? Self? The truth is that each of us is compelled on some level to continuously pursue something or someone apart from God to find relief. What idol could look 150 years into the future and call a king yet to be born to accomplish its purposes? Only God could do such a thing. In Isaiah 44, 28, God says of Cyrus, He is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. In 45.13, God declares that Cyrus would rebuild God's city and set God's exiles free. And friends, everything God said Cyrus would do, God fulfilled. God did this according to chapter 45.6, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, people may know that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. So what is the right response to such a God? God tells us in 4522, he says, turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Turn and be saved, not just from exile or an earthly conqueror, 
but from the just wrath of God for your sin, a salvation purchased by Jesus Christ's death on the cross. Isaiah chapters 46 and 47 should make us consider which God we would rather have. One that we have to carry from place to place or one who carries us. A God who cannot hear, think, speak, or save or one who makes known the end from the beginning, from ancient times what is still to come and who says, my purposes will stand and I will do all that I please. You see, what God has planned, he will do. Babylon, Judah's captor, despite all their magicians and astrologers and stargazers, were completely caught off guard and were overthrown by King Cyrus and his Persian army. In chapter 48, God reminds Judah that he announced all these things before they happened so they would know it wasn't their idols who rescued them, but God himself. Although his people were stubborn and hard-hearted, God delayed his anger. He restrained himself. He didn't cut them off for his name's sake. When God restrains his anger toward the guilty, it displays his character. He's a God who seeks opportunities for forgiveness, not for Judah's sake or our sake, but to show the world what kind of God he is. He is a God who not only is willing to forgive sinners, but who has made a way to cover our sins. Look at chapter 48, verse 17. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. If only you had paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river, your well-being like the waves of the sea. God promises peace and guidance and provision for his children, but it's different for the wicked. For them, according to verse 22, there is no peace. Isaiah chapters 40 to 48 reveal one of the most glorious views of God in all of Scripture. These chapters tell a story of a people who were a mess, bent on doing things their own way, rejecting the Lord, and extending their love and worship to other things. God afflicted them to teach and refine them. And because of his heart for sinners and persistent love, he moved heaven and earth to save them. But this isn't just a story about a people in the past. This is a story for us. This is our story as well. We think we know better. I mean, even though God has revealed himself to us and done so much for us, we still turn away from him to pick up and carry our own idols. Think about this. To whom or what are you looking to deliver you or to numb your pain? God can do for you and me what no one and nothing else can. He has power no one else possesses. He is able and willing to meet us in our moments of need, even when that need is self-inflicted. He finds no joy in our suffering. He is full of compassion and abounding in mercy. He will never walk away disgusted. He will never use our weakness against us. He never grows tired or impatient. He will never quit because he's had enough. He will never refuse to give us what he's promised because we've messed up so much. God is just as faithful to his promises on our very worst day as he is on our very best day. He knows how weak and fickle our hearts are, yet he continues to move toward us with unrelenting and empowering grace. He is able and can be trusted to save sinners. And that brings us to our final truth. God's heart to save sinners is revealed through his provision of Jesus for our salvation. God's heart to save sinners is revealed through his provision of Jesus for our salvation. So you see, God has already provided for your eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. So the question is, how will you respond? I mean, salvation is available, 
but you must individually receive it. Now, according to this passage, there are two options. We can reject his salvation and live in fear, turmoil, and frustration and spend eternity separated from God. Or we can trust and obey him and enjoy his promise of peace and rest and guidance and salvation and an eternity in God's presence. Which of those two options best describes where you are? See, God reshapes our understanding of who he is in this passage. He is our shepherd and servant, and he is also our creator. He is driven by his love and his glory, and we are the ones who benefit from that. What are you afraid of today? And how do these chapters speak to that fear? One commentator said, if you look at God through your circumstances, he will seem small and very far away. But if by faith you look at your circumstances through God, he will draw very near and reveal his greatness to you. Through Isaiah, God assures us we can trust his heart. He who formed us in the womb, he who upholds us, sustains us, carries us, and rescues us, he is the one who has made salvation possible and who willingly holds it out to sinners. To those who receive that salvation, he says, I am God and there is no one like me. Don't be afraid. Let's pray. Father God, these passages leave us humbled and in awe of your power and sovereignty. How grateful we are that all things truly are under your control and that nothing escapes you or surprises you. Help us to keep a right perspective of who you are and what you have already done for us so that our fears are diminished and our faith and trust in you grows. Thank you that although Isaiah is speaking to these Judean exiles in the passage, his words echo through the centuries to resonate in our hearts as well. We are so grateful for your love. And we, Father, love you too. In Jesus' name, amen.